The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu. The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art, scoping the Brussels Valley for the best artists and bringing them to your radio. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the KMU Studios. My name is Hector Nino, and you're listening to The Heart of Art. Today in the studio, we have a very special show for you. We will be re-airing my interview with Andrew Thomas, who is an associate professor under the Department of Visualization here at Texas A&M but is also the director of the LIVE Lab. And LIVE stands for Learning Interactive Visualization Experience. So it's basically a research lab that creates educational video games. Uh, he is also the founder of his video game company, Triceum, and is also a Telenium Game Jam chair. Uh, we have a great conversation about how he learned to code um, and his great experience in movies such as Men in Black and heading the department for EA Sports Football. So stay tuned if this is interesting to you. Um, and now for our announcements. This show actually marks the one-year anniversary of The Heart of Art. Uh, last week, I edited the 52nd episode, so this is, um, yeah, a whole new year of The Heart of Art. I wanted to take this time and thank all the artists that have come by um, the studio and have spoken to me about something that they love. Uh, I've learned so much about you, about art, and about interviewing in general. Um, I have learned so much, so I, I appreciate everyone listening and everyone who's been a part of this project. Uh, I'm so lucky to be here at KAMU when this is going on, um, and I'm so grateful to KAMU as well for providing this opportunity for me. And also the Brazos Valley. You know, I was a little um, scared of starting this at the beginning. Um, I had never had any, you know, hosting experience, so it was definitely a very intimidating task for me. Um, but you all have made this so much easier. I mean, when I get you guys here in the studios and you get to talk to me about something that you are so passionate about, uh, it just brings joy into my life. And yeah, thank you all for being vulnerable here in our studios. Um, if you are interested in being a part of this uh, show, you can email theheartofart at tamu.edu if you're an artist or if you know of any art events coming up. Uh, so make sure to email the heart of art at tamu.edu. All right, now let's revisit my interview with Andre Thomas. Today we have a very special show planned. Um, we have a very special guest. He is a pioneer in education technology, uh, and that's why he was named one of the top 100 EdTech influencers. Um, but something a little more local, he is a Chilenium Game Jam Chair uh, and has presented in, at events such as South by Southwest and TEDx. Uh, he was also the head of graphics for EA Sports Football Games and is currently an associate professor under the Department of Visualization uh, director of the Live Lab and founder of Triceum. So hi, Andre Thomas. How are you today? I'm doing great, Hector. Thank you so much for having me here. Oh, thank you for stopping by. I mean, you have such an amazing experience. I am so lucky to have you here. Uh, so before we go a little bit into your background, I kind of want to give a little summary about what the Live Lab is to our audience. So um, I know that it stands for Learning Interactive Visualization Experience Lab, right? So what does that, that mean? That is correct, yes. So the Life Lab is a research lab that is set up like a production studio that you would find in the movie or games industry. So we are creating um, with the students interactive learning experiences. Some of them are in the form of games. Some of them are um, in other forms. Um, they're not necessarily games. And we're using gaming technology to advance education. Um, the lab has about 35 
um, employees, undergraduate, graduate, PhD students, a postdoc, and a lab manager. Okay, and is it specifically focused on education? Yes. Yeah. Um, everything we do has an educational slant. Okay. Um, so the students that are working in the lab are being educated on real-world projects, but the projects we're taking in, if that's a project for other departments or colleges across campus, or if it's a project for um, organizations outside of a and or companies, they all are education-related projects. Okay, okay, awesome. Well, thank you for that little snip. Uh, we will be going more into that a little bit later. Uh, but before that, we I wanted to ask you, where are you from and where did this love for computer graphics arise? <laughs> That's a great question, Hector. <laughs> well, the love for computer graphics uh, really arose when I built my first computer, mm. um, which is quite some time ago. <laughs> and that was back in Germany when I grew up. Um, when I was a teenager, I built my first computer. Back then, we only had monochrome um, um, screens, so we didn't have color yet. And okay. I built my first computer, started programming, and created my first graphics on the screen. You know, little um, circuits, lips, and so on. It was, like, really fascinating. Like, wow, this is so cool. And then, of course, I got into games. Uh, you know, started playing games, and I really thought, like, wow, games and computers and learning i mean you gotta mesh these things together and and really combine them there's something here definitely um and who taught you how to code Did, was it something you just picked up on your own <laughs> yes wow. i had i had to teach myself um back then the um way coding was taught was still with punch cards um i didn't learn punch card um, coding, I was aware, but um, my own computer, I've started just um, hacking, essentially, um, mm. learning assembly language and, you know, playing around and just teaching myself how do you program, how do you get some the computer to do something. Right. I mean, I bet that must have been difficult. But then you went to get an MFA in game design, right, at the Laguna College of Art and Design. How did you make that jump from getting that first computer to saying, okay, I'm going to get an MFA in game design? <laughs> well, that says, <laughs> that's a great jump um, and many, many years in between. Oh, really? uh, so I've got my the MFA at um, LCAT, Laguna College of Art and Design, rather late. Um, hmm. That was in 2017. Oh. Before then, I spent 22 years in the movie and games industry hmm. um, where I, you know, Again, because I was self-taught, I was lucky enough in L.A., um, I lived in L.A. for a while, to pick up um, work working on big blockbuster movies like Men in Black, Tomorrow Never Dies, Con Air, oh, wow. um, Independence Day, and then worked on some animated movies like Valiant and Ant Bully, um, doing computer graphics wow. before joining um, EA Sports hmm. as a head of graphics for the football franchises. Right. So you kind of went the other route. You got the experience first and then you got the degree, huh? That That is correct. Okay. Yes. Because back then when I started out a um, graphics or visual effects or animation didn't really exist as something that you could learn in mm. school and, and certainly not game design, even though games were around, um, you know, at that time. But it wasn't something that you can go to school and learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were at the at the very beginning of that. And I mean, I, I'm sure a lot of young audiences out there know about EA Sports football games. Uh, what kind of projects were you leading there? Well, all of the football games. Oh, wow. um, so Madden NFL, college football, NFL head coach, NFL tour, NFL blitz. Wow. Um, yes, every year we have um, college football and Madden NFL um, mm -hmm. that had to be done. And I was overseeing all of the graphics. Um, it was a rather large team of artists and engineers um, software engineers creating the graphics for the football games. Um, wow. A lot of challenge and a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, that must have been very exciting, and we're very lucky to have you. Um, so now into the live lab. Uh, I know that at, here at A&M, um, our goals have kind of shifted, and we are now moving towards a time where we're focusing on the arts. We have this new school of the performance, visualization, and fine arts that uh, I know you're a part of. Um, and we're kind of enhancing that cross-collaboration between disciplines. And I was wondering what disciplines are working together in the Live Lab? Well, many disciplines. Um, to make a game, um, you need many different disciplines. You mm -hmm. need artists, you need designers, 
you need um, programmers, so computer scientists, mm -hmm. you need educational, for educational games, you need content experts. So wow. for example, we made an award-winning math game um, with our math department um, here mm -hmm. at a and um, that's helping students, college students, um, succeed in calculus. Um, wow. So you need the content experts, you need educational experts to work with you, you need business experts to, you know, for project management, um, producing the game. And of course, if you want to sell the game or get it out there, so you need marketing and sales. So oh, yeah. game production, just game production, development, encompasses a lot of different disciplines by its very nature. Right. And does the Live Lab take care of the whole process from start to finish? Does it even get into that marketing well, so it doesn't quite get into the marketing side because okay. we're not a commercial entity. We're a research right. lab. And so what we do is we develop a, depending on the project we're working on, we develop a prototype or a finished product. But then mm -hmm. the finished product is for a client. It right. could be the National Science Foundation. It could be Homeland Security. It could be another department um, on college that we're working with because they wanted a specific project. So we wouldn't do the sales and marketing portion of that hmm. in the lab itself. However, we have learned that being able to somewhat market ourselves hmm. is beneficial. That helps with recruiting, that helps with um, being noticed. Sponsors will come, organizations will come and seek us out. So we started last year actually having a marketing person in the lab that's helping with social media and she's doing a fabulous job just you know putting us out there and talking about the students that are doing amazing work in the lab and you know profiling them so that future employers can see them and say oh we want to hire those guys because they're really great right so you're basically encouraging departments to reach out to you absolutely to yes right yeah. awesome well, this is an art show, so I did want to talk a little bit about yes. or more about the art. Um, how important would you say are the quality of the graphics or the art in, within the learning experience? Because I know in my own experience, uh, when I was in elementary school, we had like cool math games, which is, was a website that I would go on. And it wasn't as motivating because the graphics weren't that great. But yeah, what would you say that has a part? <laughs> yes, you, you're absolutely correct. And that's, that's where we started. So when I came uh, to a and um, I didn't intend to start the Life Lab. Uh, it just came about by accident because one of the professors wanted to create a game for her very large lecture classes. She had 150 students in her class and felt like, you know what, I, I want to engage my students more. It's really hard for me to have a conversation with 150 students. And I have um, 2,000 years of history to get through. So how do I make this more interesting, more engaging? And she noticed that today's students are really into games. 97% right? of students play games four hours or more every week. Not everybody calls themselves gamers, uh, but they all play games. And so she felt like, OK, I want to make a game. Got a couple of students together and started working on the game. Now, this is an art professor, art history professor. And then the department head, who is now our dean, Tim McLaughlin, um, came to me and said, can you have a look at this and maybe help? And so we looked at it, and that became the beginning of the lab. Because the, what she had, the early beginnings, wasn't quite in a state where you would put it in front of students um, or anywhere else. Um, and so we worked on it. We got some funding, some grants, and really developed it. And you hit the nail on the head. One of the key things when people hear educational games is they roll their eyes like, oh, bad graphics, you know, probably not such great gameplay. It's just solve this question and then you get to play and then you get stopped again to solve some other uh, math problem and then you can play again. And we really wanted to change that conversation and do it differently. Um, being the head of graphics, having worked on major motion um, pictures, animated movies. And so I always knew graphics are really important. Right. Um, they're not the most important thing, but they are important. And is it possible, that was our first research question we asked, is it possible to create a triple A style quality game with a fraction of the budget and the people, the resources 
but it looks and feels like something that EA would have created. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we started off with. And so the first game we created was an art history game, Mecenas, with really good graphics, uh, just 2D at this point. Um, but that led um, people to notice, like, oh, okay, so you can make educational games that are just much better artistically. Because mm -hmm. why skimp on the art? Why skimp on the design? Because it's an educational product? I would argue it should be the other way around. Yeah. Because it's an educational product, we should actually spend more on it, not yeah. less, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yes, I, I feel like educational games have focused more on the educational portion of it, right? Rather than the whole experience in itself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for, for <laughs> making that an important point, uh, because I do think it will help a lot of people in the future. All right, you guys, we will be going on a quick break, but do not go anywhere. We will be right back. Support for KAMU comes from the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. All right, welcome back to the KMU Studios. Now we will continue my conversation with Andre Thomas, the director of the Learning Interactive Visualization Experience Lab at A&M. Um, okay, so this necessity led to Triceum. Did the Live Lab lead to Triceum, or how did that come about? <laughs> so when we developed this first game, um, Artemis Senas, we started talking to textbook publishers. So we wanted, so the professors wanted to use it in the classroom. We're a research lab. We cannot support technology. Plus grant funding is only enough to allow you to build it, but not to support it. Mm. So if you're using hosting services, where well, they still charge money, um, just because you're educational doesn't mean you get it free. So we tried to figure out, okay, how can we support a product and what do we do? And so we reached out to... Um, companies like, hey, we have this thing, would you be interested in this? And we got a lot of interest, but just couldn't make the right agreement. What they envisioned where this is going to go and what we had in mind really differed. And at that point, A&M um, said, well, why don't you just set up your own company? I was like, oh, okay. All right, fine. Um, not really <laughs> what I intended to do. Um, and so Triceum was born. I called up a friend of mine. He was a former CFO for EA Sports, um, oh, wow. Rahul, and you know, told him about it. And he's like, yeah, sure. And so we started to try to see him as a spin-off company from the lab, um, from the Life Lab, in order to maintain and support the games that have been developed. Um, and so we then licensed from a and these games and so that they can be used. So when a student has a problem or a teacher on a Sunday, because uh, they're doing the homework last minute, because mm -hmm. it's due on Monday. Right, <laughs> as usually they, happens. They have a place to go. Right. right? And so that's what, where Triceum came about, is as a spin-off company from the lab um, that have support and maintains the games that have been developed there. Wow, awesome. And so then once Triceum was created, did you then work on Variant through there? So... Yes, um, kind of. It's both. So Variant started in the lab first. Uh, Which is another video game, by the way. It, yes, var Variant Limits. Yes, that's um, that's a game we're most well known for um, worldwide because it's a calculus game <laughs> that looks and feels like Tomb Raider. Um, it's graphically very attractive, very stunning. I might say so myself. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. I've, I've seen it myself. <laughs> Thank you, Hector. Yeah. Um, so I've noticed one thing. I've noticed that our students um, one day came to me and said, oh, yes, we have to go to, I'm not going to name the college, go to another school to take calculus. It's like, why are you going, why not take it here at A&M? We have calculus classes. Oh, yeah. no, God, no. And uh, we're going to fail. It's like, so... I don't, I don't understand. So if you take the class here, you fail, but at another school, you don't. And so then you transfer the credit because you need it. Right. Well, this kind of, 
is wrong. We need to fix it. What can we do? <laughs> and I remember then um, years ago when I'm working in the movies, um, using computer graphics, I felt like, oh, I need to learn more because I'm using calculus every day. I want to understand more. I used to be a math Olympian, but then didn't really pay much attention to the math anymore as I you know, worked. And it's like, oh, can I teach it myself? So I put, picked up a calculus book and thought like, oh, let me teach myself a little bit more deeper calculus. And that did not go very well. It's like, oh, oh my goodness. Can somebody be boring and dry? Yes, pick up a calculus book. Oh, yeah, it'll put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. And so, okay, what can we do? About well, what about making a game? And mm -hmm. I've pitched that idea to executives at EA who told me that calculus, you cannot make fun and there's no money to be made. Well, they're correct on the second portion, but <laughs> since they've seen the game, they've corrected themselves and said, well, apparently you can make it fun. Uh, and <laughs> that <so> has changed. <laughs> That's good. We got some grant funding and we All got right. together with the math department here at AM, uh, who are wonderful to work with to create variant limits the first game in a series of four games. Um, we got it to a certain point and then handed it off to Triceum, who finished the game, wow. um, who had professionals working and then could build the infrastructure behind it to really finish it out and then publish the game. And that's how Variant Limits came about. Wow. Um, and hypothetically, somebody could go from the live lab, work on a game, and then go to your company, Triceum, and then go and finish off the project, right? That, that is correct. Actually, many students that started in the Life Lab when I formed the Life Lab also came when we formed Triceum. They graduated and moved straight into a job at Triceum. Wow. Um, so one thing that I always felt really strongly about is that everybody should always earn a fair wage. Mm -hmm. And so in the Life Lab, everybody starts with an internship, but these are paid internships. Oh. And everybody that works there gets really well paid. A um, lot of you know, other people or departments always excuse us we're stealing everybody because we're paying too much. It's like, well, what's too much? You know, mm -hmm. just everybody should be paid fairly for the work they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so it's always been very important to me. And yes, we had lots of people that went straight from the Life Lab to Triceum. Um, and continues our work there. Right. Is it important for you to mentor people that are going to be like the future of computer graphics? Oh, of course. Yeah. I mean, that's the reason I'm here at mm -hmm. AM. When I was at EA, I came to AM to advise the program, um, mm -hmm. the visualization program on, you know, strategies, on the curriculum, and I would hire um, from here. I've been. Oh all over um, the U.S. to all different kinds of schools, but I always love coming to A&M and hire the Aggies mm -hmm. because you cannot do better than hire an Aggie, in my opinion. And uh, there's just something about A&M and the students, the faculty here, that is special, right? So the core values and everything with it, and you just can't go wrong. You know? mm -hmm. And when I left EA, AM called up, said, Can you help us with our gaming program? Because we were going to move to Switzerland at that time. And so I spoke to my wife, I was like, Well, Switzerland, College Station, it's almost the same thing. You know, why not come here? <laughs> yeah. um, because I really wanted to help and I wanted to help the students. Right. And I've got so much joy out of seeing the students grow and challenging them to do something they don't think they actually can achieve. Mm -hmm. So in my classes, I teach one class where the students are producing professional quality work. And when they come in, I remember one student and she just gave a talk um, last semester. Um, early on, she, was, she came into the class and she's like, I can't do this. And she was in tears. There is no way. It's like, yes, you can. I believe in you. And I, I worked with her and, and she did great. She then ended up working in the Life Lab. She got a job at Triceum. It was heartbreaking when we had to um, reduce the staff at Triceum and have to, had to lay people off. And for many of them, their career was like Life Lab, Triceum. It's like, oh, all really straight. And then all of a sudden, you know, we had to let people go. Mm. That was really, really heartbreaking and difficult. Um, it was very tough for her as well. 
But she's got a great job now at a company, at a game company in, in Dallas and is coming here to campus, giving back to our students and, and talks and just done wonderful. And it's so great to see, mm -hmm. right? When you see somebody that didn't have belief what they could be doing to really blossom and, and star. And it's like amazing. Look at what, what you've achieved. And you just at the beginning of your career. Right. Yeah. They're getting all the best experience they can. Yes. Definitely. Uh, well, uh, Andre Thomas, uh, thank you so much for being here at A&M and for passing on that expertise that you have. Um, is there anything about the art of computer graphics or about the live lab that you don't think we've covered, but that you want our audience to know about? Well, I one thing you've briefly mentioned um, that we haven't talked about is Chilenium. Right. I like to talk about Chilenium. Of course. <laughs> it's coming up, right? February? It, it is. It is. February 24th to 26th. Yes. It started out, I went to a conference and I sat in a session where they're talking about game jams. And I sat there with a professor from K-State. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did a game jam? Yeah. All right. Great. So I came home, um, spoke to my students, said, hey, shall we have a game jam? And they got really excited. Yes, absolutely. Let's have a game jam. Okay. So I called up the professor from Case and said, hey, okay, so we're going to do the game jam. Are you guys coming? He's like, well, it's going to be a year from now. I was like, no, we're doing it in two weeks. <laughs> and they're like, okay. So they actually drove down. Um, we had the first game jam. It, it was very small, 12 students. Hmm. and But it was really enjoyable. Everybody had a lot of fun and was mostly organized by our students. And then we was like, okay, well, should we make this an annual thing? Mm -hmm. And then we started really organizing it. And again, all student-organized, student-led. Um, and it's grown into the largest um, collegiate in-person game jam in the world. Wow. Um, before COVID, we had over 400 students come here to a and for 48 hours making games. Um, wow. So artists, designers, programmers, um, musicians from all over the country. We even had teams from China and from Canada fly in to just participate in Chilenium. Oh uh, COVID happened. We didn't do it because we didn't want to do the online version. It's like, mm. no, the experience has really got to be in person. You've got to experience it. And so we, the first year after COVID was last year we did it. And now it's coming up in February. Again, we expect about 200 to 250 people okay. participating. We have, I mean, all the major game companies are sending employees that are coming here mentoring the students oh, wow. all weekend long. We have great food. Some of the students eat better food during that weekend than the rest of the year. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, because we get catered food and because we have yeah. great sponsors that are helping us really put this event on. And again, it's all done by our students. They organize the whole thing. They run the event. And it's for students. It's the, one of the most amazing experiences um, I can you know, tell you about. So if you have a chance, um, come and check it out and, and, and participate. You don't need to know how to make games. There's people there that will teach you. You can learn. Um, spend 48 hours learning how to make a game. Um, make some friends, get some swag, um, get some free food. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, February 24th, right? February that, 24th that is to correct. the 26th. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, make sure to keep an ear out for that. Um, well, thank you so much once again. Um, I'm so lucky to have you in our studio, and I can't wait to see where all of your projects go in the future. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, you guys, that is the end of our show. A big thank you to Andre Thomas for stopping by. Uh, and a big thank you to all of you listeners. Uh, thank you if you've been listening uh, for the first year. I really appreciate it. And if you are interested in that Chilenium Game Jam, make sure to go and attend any days between February 24th and February 26th. Uh, so have a great week and make sure to tune in next week. I'm Hector Nino, and you've been listening to The Heart of Art, a production of 90.9 KAMU-FM. You can find all of our shows anytime at kamu.tamu.edu.
The Heart of Art is brought to you by the Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts at Texas A&M University, bringing innovative and culturally diverse visual and performing arts programming to Texas A&M University and the Brazos Valley. The Academy for the Visual and Performing Arts fosters the creativity of our community via the transformative power of the arts. The Heart of Art is sponsored in part by the Texas A&M University Art Galleries, which includes the Stark and Forsyth Galleries located inside the MSC. The galleries provide a variety of opportunities to experience art exhibitions, events, and hands-on activities. More information at uart.tamu.edu.